other variables that can predict for outcomes that are not good are high LDH or high inflammatory markers prior to CAR T cell yeah. infusion. And that may get back to the same thing about bulk, about rapidly proliferative tumors. Um, it, it may be just, we're all talking about the same variable here of just bad lymphomas behave badly, but that is another factor. Now we've been talking uh, so far about mostly oxy captagene cellulosa, which clearly there's, I think, a large body of evidence that's emerging and it's very encouraging long-term follow-up. That's not the only product approved. Obviously, uh, tisogen like Lucil is also approved in this exact same setting, basically uh, after two uh, prior therapies. Jason, you want to just tell us some of the long-term data that, or the real-world data that's emerging with that? Yeah, and that, that's based on the Juliet study, which, as you said, was based on very similar criteria to what was the Zuma-1 trial. It did not allow for primary mediastinal patients, which is one of the main differences in eligibility. And as we alluded to before, it did have a longer manufacturing time frame. Um, so there was allowed for bridging therapy on that study, which as we're talking about today, may have had some impact on outcomes. The early data from the Juliet study showed a complete response rate um, a little bit lower than was seen on the Zuma-1 trial. However, it was still around 40%. And what we're seeing is that patients who've achieved a complete response on Juliet are tending to keep that response. And we have a poster at the ASH 2019 meeting now updating it around 30 some months follow up. And what we're seeing is a plateau for patients who've had long-term response. And what about the real world data with this, with this agent? There's some data coming at this meeting as well from some of the registries that are reporting some of the real world data. Not quite as many patients as we've seen in the real world data sets um, from our CAR T cell consortium or from the Dana Farber that was presented by, by Karen last year at the ASH meeting. But there are data that are being reported at this meeting showing that results seem to be very similar to what was seen on the clinical trials. And I, I agree with the comments earlier. It's very encouraging to see real world data where patients don't necessarily meet any eligibility criteria or at all the eligibility criteria that were seen on the early studies, but are able to receive these therapies, able to survive the toxicities, and then still have similar long-term outcomes. Obviously more follow-ups needed on these real world data sets, but so far so good. Now, one of the biggest issues that uh, I think we've seen and the adoption of tisogenic leclusil in the clinics has actually been difficulties with obtaining a drug uh, in a timely fashion and within specifications. Yes. And there were a couple, there was an ab interesting abstract about that uh, today. Uh, who would like to discuss that? Uh, Jason? Well, not necessarily specific to that abstract, but in general, the, the viability threshold for the product on the clinical trial was 70%. At the FDA approval, it can't, the viability required for releasing the product was 80%, a little bit higher of a bar. And their um, manufacturing challenges to date have been described outside of this discussion today, but there's as well known that there have been some challenges to make the product. However, uh, the most recent data I've heard is they're able to deliver a product to 90% of patients who are, have an apheresis in an attempt to make the product. Some of that is through an access protocol for products that are not quite meeting viability but are able to receive it. That means 10% of patients are not able to receive product, but it's, um, it's an ongoing challenge. So in regards to that specific abstract, I think what they were able to show was in a very in a limited numbers of patients treated in the, in the real world that they didn't see any difference in outcomes for the patients who had viabilities between 60 and 80 um, and patients who were 80 and above. And so that, that gives you, at least as a physician treating a patient, when you get an out-of-spec product, it gives you more confidence that you're giving the patient an active product. And we should say that in Europe, the approval is actually for 70% viability for release. Um, but I think that 10% number of not being able to to deliver a product is actually still pretty significant because with 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 axicaptogene cellulosal, it's more like one to two percent um, in terms of not being able to deliver a product. And again, it gets to the fact that we could tease out differences between the different products and long and toxicity and efficacy all we want. But when you have a patient in front of you, it doesn't matter if you can't give treat that patient, right? And so that's that's going to be paramount until we have products that are equally available. But I, I will say that it's not surprising about the viability issue because mm -hmm. the dose is actually made on, cal calculated on viable cells, and so they're getting viable cells. So I think it's a bit of, a, it's, it's a bit of an arf artificial bar that uh, they're be being forced to do, uh, to, to uh, meet. Um, now we also saw, uh, you know, in, in clinical trials we're pretty restrained about who we treat. People have to meet eligibility criteria. Uh, clearly there's a perception uh, of treating 80-year-olds, uh, you know, if they, if they, can they really tolerate axicaptogene cellulosal, you know, is tisogen leclusal maybe a little kinder, gentler? And, you know, the, the issue is it's really hard to tease out in the real-world setting whether physicians are, are using these biases when they're selecting products. Mm -hmm. what, do you, what do you think you've seen in your, in your 
real world data. So I think, you know, so I, we haven't yet talked about some of the different kinetics of 41BB versus CD28 cars in terms of uh, um, uh, rapidity of expansion and then that leading to possible differences in toxicity. But the bottom line is that the 41BB cars seem to expand more slowly and that leads to a sort of um, more modified toxicity profile potentially. Um, and, um, and so you might suspect that you would take your older, frailer, and potentially sicker patients to a 41BB car, but you have to remember that um, if, if it's taking two, one or two more weeks to get that car or 10% or of them aren't getting it, you've lost your window to be able to treat some of these patients. So I can say that in my practice, um, our sicker, you know, our sicker um, patients who are more worried about their survival through the manufacturing process, we're actually taking to oxycaptogene solucil. So I think uh, in, in my practice, it got flipped on its head. It's yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I think uh, one of the interesting things we've seen in several of the large sort of real world data sets with Axicel is that the outcomes for older patients, or at least defined as over 65, uh, are equivalent and in some cases better than the younger patients. And so uh, more analyses has to be done to see if the, the older patients just have uh, you know, better, better disease features or, or uh, performance status that, that, that sort of uh, accounts for that, but there may be also something in, in uh, the biology of their T cells or something else that we need to better understand. But so uh, we, we don't have an age limit for CAR T cell therapy. We are starting to see physicians in our practice and our group make decisions on which CAR T cell therapy to use for their lymphoma patients based on some of these factors that you've mentioned, which, which is that uh, the, the toxicity, severe toxicity rates are lower with, with uh, the T cell product. And so that um, if you have a patient with very poor performance status or a low ejection fraction or something else, some physicians are choosing to use that one product, but of course that's weighed against the fact that, as we said, they're less likely to get that product back and be able to give it to the patient. And the only other thing I would add is that if we look at the, the complete response rates and durable response rates across the two FDA approved products and the third one that, that was presented here at ASH, um, and, and you acknowledge the, the differences in the study design in patients, I think that the, the CR rates and durable response rates are very comparable across these products. So then it, it does factor in about the toxicities and the ability to get these therapies when we're making these choices.